Columbia Yacht Club is a very unique organization. It's a floating yacht club, and it's over 100 years old and has had the unique distinction of being afloat all that time. It had formerly a vessel, the Pierre Marquette, that succumbed to fire and had to be replaced by another vessel, the Florida, which in about 1983 was over 100 years old. It was a converted side wheeler, cast iron riveted hull. It was leaking badly, so they needed a floating replacement. And they discovered a vessel going to the scrapyard in Nova Scotia, went up and looked at it, and thought it had potential with some modification to become a very unique club ship. Hello, my name is Jules Trout. I was one of the marine engineering officers that helped bring the motor vessel Levick White down to Chicago from Nova Scotia in 1983 and been involved with Columbia Yacht Club ever since. And one of my fun duties aboard is to volunteer to give engine room tours. This is a very unique ship. Obviously, it makes us a very unique yacht club as well. And so it's kind of fun to be able to show visitors, guests, uh, especially those from Canada, what's so unique about Columbia Yacht Club. So we're going to kind of go through uh, one of my normal engine room tours, if you will, assuming there is such a thing in my life as normal, and give you an idea of what's down here. A little bit of background. This vessel is very, very unique. It was built, the keel was probably laid around 1945 and entered service in August of 1947 and was the only way to get to Prince Edward Island from the mainland up in Nova Scotia. It uh, had two or three predecessors and when this one was built, it had to have ice worthiness because the ice in the, the Gulf of St. Lawrence gets pretty thick. It had to be extremely maneuverable, relatively shallow draft, uh, and, as I say, very maneuverable, very powerful, able to carry railroad cars and automobiles, which it did. When you enter the ship now, you come in on the rail deck, and there are three parallel railroad tracks carrying up to 18 railroad cars and or locomotives. There was room up on the deck above it for 68 automobiles, and all of that equipment entered the vessel from the stern, so it backed in to the port to take on rail cars and automobiles and, of course, people typically carried up to 250 day passengers, could carry up to 950 people. We get about that many now on 4th of July fireworks night down here. But uh, again, very unique vessel. At one time, one of the, the largest icebreaker in the world, one of the largest yachts in the world. We came down the seaway registered as a yacht for somebody told me once just under $80 instead of paying on the basis of gross tonnage. So that was kind of nice. Again, let's, let's start a little bit now about specifics of the vessel itself. It is a diesel electric drive and the reason for that was it had to have very fast response to changes in both RPM and direction of turn of all four propellers. It has two forward and two aft or in naval terminology four screws. For variability you can turn the vessel in its own length, you can wobble it sideways, uh, just an incredibly maneuverable ship. We'll show you these consoles here in the, in the control room where we are now, just outside of the main engine rooms. There's a set of these two console or pedestals up on the bridge. There's another set back aft in a little doghouse-like structure at the extreme stern of the ship. And that's where the actual maneuvering took place when it backed in to pick up automobiles and rail cars or of course to discharge them. There are two pedestals, as I said, up on the bridge and they are a little shinier than these. These have been sitting for about 20 years with no service and nobody polishing the brass, so they've kind of deteriorated a little bit. But the function's still the same. This vertical lever controls, it's in a neutral position when it's dead center. And you can turn it back astern or bring it ahead and the further ahead you go or astern you go, the higher the RPM. And there's an RPM gauge for each of the propellers that respond to that control change right here on the top of the panel and some uh, warning lights and so on. Ship's Telegraph was for obviously these, this was an emergency station because down here with no windows we have no idea where the vessel is or what dangers uh, might be pending and so on. 
So the bridge or the aft station would ring down a command for things like slow ahead, slow astern, and so on. And the needle would shift and then we would go up to that position and recognize that signal. The corresponding needle up on the bridge or wherever it came from would then equal the same. So again, this was the emergency uh, control area. Primary up on the bridge underway and backing in and out to take on cars or discharge them, the one back on the stern. Again, being a diesel electric drive ship, all the engines that we'll see in the engine room shortly did was create DC power. That power was distributed as needed to four large motors, which we'll see shortly thereafter. Those motors were connected to the shafts and turned the propellers to move the vessel. Uh, in a minute, I'll open one of these doors. You can get an idea of what 1947 state-of-the-art electronics was. It's uh, our answer to a local Frankenstein movie set about what it looks like. So hang on just a minute, and I'll open up that panel for you. Just to give you an idea of how things have improved, uh, many of you are probably familiar with circuit breakers in your fuse panels at home, either the round screw in type with a button or just a switch lever when you blow a fuse and you take the equipment that blew the fuse off, then you return to power by just throwing the lever. Well, these are a little different. These are all individual circuit breakers. This one, for example, uh, does turning motors and repair lubes and spares and motor blowers and so on. To break one or shut it off, you can just push that button and then to reset it, you had to crank it like that. I took a handle off of this one just to give you an idea. Little Things have changed quite a bit from a technology standpoint. That's what a, a circuit breaker looks like in 1947. We'll move over to a doorway over here and show you some more. There's probably about, oh, somebody threw a figure out once of about 80 miles of copper wire aboard the ship and big bus bars and so on. So lots of, uh, lots of scrap metal, if you will. Being a control room, again, all of these gauges just were indicators of how things were functioning, where power was going or not going, and so on. As I say, this is my Frankenstein movie set stuff. We had old resistors and old cartridge fuses, lots of wire, lots of copper bus bars, lots of heat sinks, those big you know, capacitors and resistors back there, knife plate switches, miles and miles of wire all bundled and so on. This was a nice place to be. It was a lot quieter up here than standing next to these diesel engines, which you'll see next. Following the first venture of inspecting the vessel in Nova Scotia, members of the club went back up to submit a bid to purchase the vessel and keep it from the scrapyard. And that bid was accepted, and then reality struck. They thought, how are we going to get this thing to Chicago? It's almost 400 feet long, 8,000 tons. One of the members of the club, Hugh Hagen, was a deck officer graduate of the United States Merchant Marine Academy at Kings Point, New York. He came to our Chicago chapter alumni meeting and said, guys, have I got a deal for you. I need 11 volunteers, five more deck officers and six engineering officers to help me bring a 400-foot ship down the St. Lawrence Seaway around Easter of 1983. Uh, the pay is $1. It'll probably take 10 days to two weeks. Your crew will be unlicensed, unseasoned yacht club members. May I see a show of hands? Eleven of us said, that sounds like an opportunity. Let's do it. So that's how the Merchant Marine Academy got involved in helping to bring uh, Columbia's club ship to Chicago. What we're standing in now is part of the auxiliary equipment areas of the ship. And this is typical of all vessels. Uh, away from the main boilers or turbines or whatever propulsion system the ship has, usually all the auxiliary and support equipment is scattered around near it or around its periphery. For example, on my left, this is one of the three ship's generators. These generated power for the ship's use, not for its propulsion system. They were just smaller versions. On my right here is what's called a general service pump. This is a vertical shaft centrifugal pump, and you'll notice there are five wheels here. Those are valves. And those are intake valves. And over on this side, you can't see all of it, but there are five similar discharge valves. What that means is you can take suction from one of five places and send that fluid to one of five other places. And the way the ship is built, I'm standing now about two feet to three feet above a steel deck plate, which you would think is the bottom of the ship, but it isn't. 
It's the top of the double bottom tanks. The bottom of the vessel is actually about a four foot tank, if you will, longitudinally, basically almost the whole length of the ship and partitioned appropriately. And that's where you start with carrying fuel oil. One of the reasons this vessel was taken out of service in 1981 was that when all uh, eight engine units were running, it burned 55 metric tons of fuel oil a day. Now, when oil was cheap, that wasn't a major consideration. But uh, in recent years, as oil prices went up, it became more and more expensive to operate this ship. And that's why it was replaced by a newer, more fuel efficient version. But in any event, in each of those tanks, that, which are down below me, as you got rid of the oil and used it for fuel for the engines, you created a void and the weight, the center of gravity of the ship started to move up as, the, as you got rid of weight down below and it became starting to become top heavy. So to counteract that, you fill those tanks with water after you got done using the oil that was in them. And to do that, you could take suction from overboard, which this vessel did, through one of these valves and then you could direct it to appropriate tanks through one of the other discharge valves. Or if you had a tank you wanted to pump out, you would take suction from one of these and direct it somewhere else, either overboard, assuming there was no oil contamination, of course, or uh, anywhere else to build your ballast tanks in the vessel. But that's why these are called multi-service pumps. Now we're gonna continue just around the corner because when you have uh, different fluids in a tank, you have to clean the tank out and you also get rust and scale and, and deposits of debris that you don't want in the water or in the fuel, certainly and you have to get those out, so we'll show you how that's done. This device is called a DeLaval oil purifier. Strange looking thing, it kind of looks like a pressure cooker, and in some respects, it is. This holds the lid down, you pull these up and screw them down tight, and if you want to see what's inside, it's going to be a little difficult, but there is a spinning bowl in there, and the dirty uh, fluid coming from one of those tanks would come in here and any particles, this spun about 10,000 revolutions a minute, and any particles were thrown up and over the lip and down into an opening and just overboard or to garbage or whatever. The pure fluid went to the center and was sent to what's called a day tank, meaning a day's supply of oil, for example, typically fuel oil. And so that's how we get the debris out of the fuel oil that's left by the water or whatever else was in the tank at one time. Here's some other auxiliary equipment. This is a heat exchanger, kind of a shell and tube type unit. There's a tube sheet here with a lot of holes and tubes are bent in a U, kind of like a trombone slide. And they're inside there and typically, in this case, either hot water or steam would go around the tubes and heat them or there'd be steam in the tube. Since the diameter of the incoming and outgoing pipes are different, that tells me this was a steam water heater and steam came in through the top and as it condensed it went out through the smaller tube and heated water in the shell of this unit and that hot water could have been for domestic service or heating or predominantly for domestic service. Okay, if you notice too, I used the flashlight as a pointer. This was a great and the only real communication tool down here. The diesel engines are locomotive size. The noise was incredible just when they were running when we were going through ice fields and cracking up to 16 foot thick ice outside the hull, that doubled the noise volume, so we all wore earmuffs, and when you wanted somebody's attention, you would shine a light in their face and catch it, their eyes would see that light and they'd know you wanted to talk and then you'd get right up to each other and, and literally shout at each other and communicate. Works in, in dimly lit bars too, I might mention, but you never go in an engine room without your flashlight and your channel locks if you're a good marine engineering officer. Okay, we're on the, on the floor now between two of the eight main engines. There are four in this engine room and four more in the, neck, in the aft engine room. And these are 12-cylinder Dominion Sulzer diesel engines. They're broken into six-cylinder groups. This is six cylinders here, six cylinders down there, with a generator in the center. And here we have the control for this engine as far as direction of rotation and speed. I have to laugh at that because it only ran forward and it only ran full speed. If it didn't, we wired the governor shut so it would stay at full speed. But this was a control panel and indicators of uh, oil, just like indicators in your car. Oil pressure, temperature, things of that nature. These engines were water cooled with fresh water. Now the ship worked in salt water, so you couldn't use salt water in the engines because of the mineral content, it would cake up. 
So they had fresh water cooling the engines. That water was sent to a heat exchanger and cooled by seawater and sent back to the engines, much like the radiator in your car takes the heat out through the air passing over those fins in the radiator and then sends it back to your engine. This device up top here, this is how you start a diesel engine, or at least these, with compressed air. You would pull on the chain and that would open this valve and the compressed air would get the pistons to start moving and when they got up to speed you would open the fuel valves and then the fuel would get in the cylinders and ignite and keep the engine running and off it went. Each cylinder had its own fuel pump. That's what these are. And this platform also provides an area where you could get up here and work up on the top of the engine. Uh, there's a lot of valves and things to be, exhaust valves to be adjusted up top here, fuel distribution ports to be sometimes reset. But pretty much these were very reliable and self-sufficient engines, meaning they didn't need a whole lot of tuning or fussing with or anything other than keeping them lubricated. What was unique about this trip, too, you need licensed officers on any merchant ship, as you do on, a, on any naval vessel, but let's talk about the merchant marine. Uh, you have licensed officers, both deck and engineering, and then you have enlisted men in the crew, where our crew had never been on a ship before. They were Columbia Yacht Club members, and our training had obviously to be very different working with them. Uh, we, Merchant Marine Academy, Kings Point, New York, graduates, were kind of nervous about what we were getting into with a totally untrained crew, but to the, to the respect and my sincere admiration of all of the Yacht Club members, and especially the ones that I worked with down here, everybody rolled up their sleeves, really turned to, and it was just a phenomenal experience, and it went very well. I'll tell you, too, the Seaway Commission was very nervous about the nature of this operation, until we'd gotten through about the second or third set of locks, uh, there's about 720 to 730 feet elevation difference between Chicago and Nova Scotia. So going through the series of locks, after the second or third set, they realized that we knew what we were doing. And in fact, at the end of the seaway, we all got a medallion commending us for our safe passage through the seaway and our professionalism and so on. So that was kind of a nice tribute. Not just, not just to the King's Pointers, but to the whole crew of this beautiful vessel. There's one section in this filming that's simply time-lapse photography, just showing some of the activity on deck coming into an area of one of the locks. And each time there was this bevy of activity. So we thought it'd be kind of fun to shoot a time-lapse of it and give you an idea how much went on. We had a resident Scotsman aboard, that's Gene McCormick playing the bagpipes on deck. Uh, he is a Kings Point deck officer and uh, loved to play the pipes, so he paraded up and down and did Amazing Grace and a number of the other bagpipe standards. Very proficient musician. This device is kind of unique to vessels and near and dear to the hearts of marine engineers who think steam is the best kind of power ever. It's a steam reciprocating feed water pump. It has a piston over here and you can see some of the linkage and steam from the boiler would cause that piston to go up and down. This is a duplex double acting steam pump or water pump and then it would provide water at about 300 pounds pressure into the boiler it had to be higher than the steam pressure or the steam would not let it come into the boiler. And one of the guys on my watch was able to tune this thing like a Swiss watch and just control that water level in the gauge glass and so on magnificently. He also had an advantage over the rest of us. Without his hearing aid on, he was as deaf as a post. And uh, so the noise didn't bother him at all. 
But uh, for the rest of us mere mortals, our ears would be kind of ringing for a while after we got out of here from the constant noise level. Um, I was just looking around, a lot of the markings have kind of come off. A lot of the nameplates on the valves had been taken as souvenirs, so we had no idea really walking onto a strange ship what any of this stuff was. Well, we knew what things were, but where the controls were and what, tank, what was in the tanks and so on was kind of a mystery. So all day Saturday, I went to the hardware store first thing Saturday morning. I bought all of their masking tape and marking pins, and we started in. We'd open a tank and see if it was fuel oil or lube oil, if it was fresh water or salt water, bilge or ballast, and then we'd label it and close it up and then follow the pipes to it and from it back to pumps, label the pumps, trace the conduit from the pumps back to a switch someplace, label the switch box, and that's how we started. All of the pressure gauges, the thermometers and so on, we kind of marked mid-range temperature or pressure with marking pins. Our training for the crew started with if the marks are between, or if it's between the marks, fine. If it isn't, yell for help. And then I'll show you when we get into the, into the next engine room on the back side of these engines, some of the other things that the crew members had to watch for. Here's one of the original markings. This thermometer should read uh, 90 to 100 degrees and check it each half hour. Pretty sophisticated. Here's uh, some of the masking tape that says, don't fill the tank from this valve, use the makeup valve. Just things like this. Many of them have disappeared over 20 years, but that's kind of what our training to the crew was. And again, it worked. These folks just worked their little fannies off. They couldn't have been happier with them and how they all pitched in. And by the time we were done, it, it was almost a click. This was kind of our ship. Well, that, of course, is all you know, dissipated so much, but we're still incredibly proud of what we did and saving this delightful old lady of the sea from the scrap heap and making it a, a very unique yacht club. This was the first time I had been on an icebreaker and we got an opportunity firsthand to see what an incredibly powerful and well-built vessel this was. It had been designed specifically for service in the Gulf of St. Lawrence very shallow or relatively shallow bays, tight, narrow passages had to be extremely maneuverable, very responsive to throttle changes and so on. And of course it had to tolerate ice. We got a lesson in that uh, literally right from the get-go. Uh, there was a map hanging on the wall in the cafeteria area and that traced the daily progress of our trip. And it started out with ice oh, roughly two to three feet thick and then the next mark was something on the order of five to six feet, then it got up to about eight to 10, then it got to 12, and at one point there was a mark on the uh, chart that said, holy, we'll refrain from the uh, picturesque description, but it was about 16 feet thick. That was the thickest ice we came through. As noisy as it was in the engine room with just the diesels running, you have no way to describe adequately what it was like going through that thick ice. It was literally just a continual explosion of horrendous magnitude. monster here to my left is a marine boiler. More specifically, it is a D-type, D as in David, marine boiler. It gets that name or that uh, designation. This is a horizontal cylinder, a steam and water drum. You're looking at the end of it here. That's a sight glass, that glass uh, tubular affair here. And typically you would see water halfway up that glass tube, which is as it should be. The bottom half of this drum kind of sideways, like my flashlight, was full of water and steam in the top half. And then directly below it is another drum called a mud drum. I don't know if you can see that or not, but it's similar to this one, but it's just down lower. And there are straight tubes connecting the two. And then there are tubes that are bent and surround the combustion chamber. These are burners here and here. 
and a big combustion chamber inside. So those tubes came from that drum and down in a curve like this to the bottom, just like a letter D. This one is reversed, of course, but that's where it gets its name from, a D-type boiler. And these are just some of the controls and so on. These are the burners themselves, here and here. And then over to the sides that you can't see are the fuel oil pumps, pumps for the water going into the boiler and for the condensate as the steam condenses back to a liquid, coming back, settling in a tank, letting the air escape from it before it comes back into the boiler. Uh, the vessel ran, as I said before, from the power generated by these engines, but the boilers were used for the heating, the living spaces of the ship, for cooking up in the galley in the dining room, that was all done on steam tables, and for heating those cars up on the rail deck in the wintertime. If you had a tank car full of oil or molasses, some fluid like that that got very thick or viscous when it got cold, you couldn't get it out of the tank. So we provided steam on the ship to coils in those tank cars, and that kept the fluids warm so that when the cars were unloaded in, in uh, Prince Edward Island or on the mainland and there was fluid in them, they could pump that fluid out of them and then use them for something else. So that's what these boilers were for. There's one in this engine room and a duplicate of it in the, in the uh, aft engine room. We're gonna move on now to the aft engine room and I'm gonna show you what the back side of these engines look like. This is the back side of one of these six cylinder segments of these Salser diesel engines. This device is a manifold to distribute lube oil. These are lube oil pumps with little glass windows so you can see the oil level in them and these are the adjustment knobs for the flow from them. And the oil is distributed, you see all these little capillary tubes at various parts of the engine, that's what they're for and these are the, the pumps. It's like the oil pump in your car again, but you just have one. These have multiple units and the guys on my watch always had to open this little flap and you could see the level of oil in this tank. Right now it's right about there. I told them I never wanted to see it below about halfway in that sight glass. So religiously they had to come around and check the oil in each of these engines and keep it full all the time on their watch. The watches by the way were four hours on and eight hours off. I was in charge of the four to eight shift so we were on duty from 4 in the morning till 8 in the morning, and then again from 4 in the afternoon until 8 in the evening. And that's very typical when you had an 8 to 12 and a 12 to 4 watch. Okay? So we're going to move down a little bit to the center area here. I'll show you some of the cooling lines for the generators, which were in the center between these pairs of six-cylinder engine components, and also how we checked oil level in some of the tanks down below us. So that's the next stop on the tour. Follow me. All right, this is the center section. This is the, the uh, generator between the, the two six cylinder units. Over here, this, this structure is a fuel oil filter. And in it are two vertical stacks of discs about oh, four inch diameter and they're window screen. And there's some coarse window screen, wide, kind of wide openings and then fine mesh and they're staggered, coarse fine, coarse fine. So you have a stack of them and they go in one, one side or the other in this housing. And there's a lever at the top to, to control which stack the, fl the oil is flowing through, the fuel oil, before it goes to the oil pumps and into the cylinders and so on. And they're changed or cleaned every watch. You take one stack out, over on the side of the vessel there's a stainless steel sink and kerosene, and a, you take a brush and screen, or, and scrub rather, each disc, and then put it back and put it back in the unit. There's a marking up here, these were last cleaned on April 8th of 1983. So that was just about uh, near the end of the trip. And then as I say, you'd throw the lever and then the, uh, the clean screens would get the fluid and then you'd take the dirty ones out and so on. Remember I talked about checking oil levels. This is a dipstick. If you listen, that noise you hear is a, the, the stick itself hitting the bottom of one of the tanks down where I'm standing and it was calibrated, and that's how you knew how much oil was in that tank. That was a lube oil tank down below us. Over here are the cooling water lines for the generator. The only way I could get the guys on my watch to remember that the cooling water came in on the right and out on the left was that your heart is on your left, it's always warmer, so 
feel these each time you walk by, the one on the left should be warmer than the one on the right. That tells you that cooling water is flowing through the generator area and removing heat buildup from the generator itself. The Canadian Coast Guard sent an icebreaker out as a final salute to Abby, as we referred to her, on her final voyage, and literally circled us and horns, of course, just a bit of fond farewell. The other unique thing, too, was the emotion and genuine desires, good wishes on the part of Canadians who had, of course, traveled aboard this fine vessel. It was the only way to get to Prince Edward Island for so many years. Every time we went under a bridge or in the locks, there would be people there with signs, safe voyage, Abby, we'll miss you, we'll come down and visit you, and dropping flowers from the bridges and so on. It was just a very, very nice display of their emotion and love for this vessel. Another uh, comment that needs to be made too is how beautiful the majority of the passage down the St. Lawrence Seaway is. Every time you turn around there was another calendar or postcard view, some uh, very quaint lighthouses, just the, the landscape, the, the buildings, the homes and so on. Just a magnificent trip from that regard. Every section of the seaway required a pilot on board to assist in the safe passage of a vessel through that section of the seaway. These gentlemen were typically licensed officers, but uh, certainly licensed as pilots and had to know their respective section intimately as far as any unusual currents, underwater obstructions, reefs. So every once in a while we would see a boat come out and uh, one individual get off and one come aboard for the next leg of the voyage. This is a watch desk on our way back to the aft motor room and there's one of these in each engine room and basically this was an alarm panel with various switches uh, for the main generator number four, number three, number one, and so on and so forth. The salt water pumps, the auxiliary aft generator. If there was a low water pressure or low oil pressure, these lights would flash, horns would go off. You could use these switches to turn off the alarms and so on. And there were log books here, and every watch you maintained a record of the start of the watch, the level in a tank, at the end of that watch, the corresponding level in the tank so we knew how much fuel or uh, lube oil we were using. Uh, we must have left a heck of an oil slick, come to think of it. During the voyage, we figured out we lost about 140 gallons of lube oil a day just to leakage. We almost did not make it from the start of the trip to the midpoint, which was roughly Montreal. Uh, we almost had to shut down and be towed into port. We were that close to being totally out of lube oil and limped into Montreal. Then we were able to take on both fresh water that we lost from leakage and lube oil to, maintain, to finish this up for the balance of the trip. The Saturday before we sailed, a truck was backing up to the gangplank to drop off 14 cases of beer. And I happened to be at the top of the gangplank and he asked me if I'd sign. I said, sure, what do I care? And, uh, I'm thinking, gee, there's 12 Kings Pointers, almost 60 Yacht Club members, and some Canadians. That 14 cases, that's not nearly enough. I made the one of four. We took on 44 cases. That got us halfway to Montreal. So I think what we just saw there was taking off the empties, which were worth 10 cents a piece, and they paid for our ration in Montreal that got us to Chicago. There's one 
area that seems to contrast with the quaintness of the lighthouses and older homes and so on. It looked like spaceships and uh, geodesic domes and what have you. That was in Montreal and some of the structures left over from the World Fair. So, again, this was just kind of a record-keeping area and a great place to set your coffee cup while you were on watch and uh, you know, get your paperwork done. Okay, now, as I promised before, our next stop will be the aft motor room. We're just panning around here on the way back to that aft motor room. We are going to get there in just a minute. But, again, you can just see how auxiliary equipment is located around the vessel. Up above me, those large white structures are lube oil tanks. These are oil pumps right here, and these are vacuum pumps that work in system with the oil pumps to promote the flow of lube oil from the storage tank areas to distribution points around the ship and uh, to where you can fill your hand carriers and fill those little reservoirs we looked at earlier. You'll see heat exchangers around the back, more of those uh, lube oil purifiers. That we opened one up a little while ago, and just all kinds of auxiliary accessory equipment on board here. Uh, one, of the, one of the things that was kind of interesting, just looking at all this kind of reminded me of it. At one point, while we were in a set of locks, the order came down to, for everybody in the seaway system to stop where they were. We were in very, very dense fog. Visibility was in the hundreds of feet. And so no ships were moving any place, whether they were in the locks, out in the seaway itself, everybody stopped in place and so on, until the fog lifted. While we were in the locks, someone added some extra blowers because it was getting a little stuffy down here. And that overloaded the ship's system. So it's just like at home when you have a blackout, we were a so-called dead ship, a black ship. Nothing was running. You don't just turn a key and get everything going again. Up on the rail deck are two very small emergency diesel generators. They provide just enough power to get a small fuel pump, a small water circulating pump, a small vacuum pump, and things of that nature started. Those, in turn, are enough to start the three ship's generators, one of which is right here on my left, and get those running. They, in turn, provide the power to get things like these oil pumps and the vacuum pumps running and the fuel oil pumps and the cooling water pumps and everything else. It's a domino effect. You get everything else running, then you can start the main engines again. Now, it took us about 27 minutes from Black Ship to be back in running condition, and we were flying. We were back and forth between engine rooms, and just everybody was running around doing all this stuff and trying to remember where the valves were and so on, but we got it running. And then we all kind of just wilted a little bit. I grabbed a cup of coffee and it was standing at one of these watch desks just kind of regaining my wits. One of the young club members on my watch came up to me and he said, Jules, how do you know how to do all this stuff? I said, well, it was part of our training at the Merchant Marine Academy. He said, yeah, but didn't you say you hadn't been on a ship for quite a while? I said, well, yeah. He said, how long? I said, 20 years. That's how good the education was. Now, granted, I'm biased. I coordinate recruiting, a uh, little commercial message here. I coordinate recruiting for the Merchant Marine Academy in Illinois and Wisconsin. It's a tremendous education for young men and women coming out of high school. It's one of our five federal academies, like Army, Navy, Air Force, and Coast Guard. Uh, we spend, we're a little different. We spend one year at sea, each of our midshipmen, only two to a ship as junior officers, and it's the ultimate laboratory course. You're using a facility like this as your training tool. So you get the hands-on practical to go with the classroom theory. You get a five-year equivalent college education in three years of classroom. So it's a grind. All of the academies are. It has to be something that that young man or that woman wants. Not mom and dad or girlfriend or boyfriend or uncles and aunts and so on and so forth. Or they won't finish it. But it's a neat education. They travel all over the world. You see people of different cultures and different value standards. It's just magic. It's phenomenal. So that's the end of the commercial message. And as I promised, this time we're going to the app motor room. Follow me. Every time you club members come into our glamorous dining room for a meal, remember this footage shot of the galley and cafeteria style eating area. 
there were no bulkheads separating the galley from the eating spaces. There was a short wrought iron railing forming an aisle and a stainless steel counter where you slid your tray along rails. However, the quality of the food prepared by the club members on the uh, galley staff was absolutely superb. There's a couple of scenes in what is now the cocktail lounge. Uh, that space was basically just a waiting and reading room for the passengers on their hour to an hour and a half trip from the mainland to the island and back again. There was a, a small concession stand where the present stand is now, but there was no bar, and it didn't have nearly the warmth and uh, camaraderie that it does now presently generate. We had made a snowman, and it just shows that you don't have to go to football games to find guys taking their uh, shirts off in very, very cold weather. Uh, one of the club members had a whole lot of fun getting a suntan and reflecting off aluminum foil and uh, buddying up to the snowman for, a, am assuming, an intimate conversation. Just one of the fun things that went along. There was a lot of hard work, but there was also time to play. Okay, as promised, we are finally in the aft motor room. I thought I'd show you first just some of the components so you get an idea of size of those locomotive size engines. This is one of the pistons from one of those six cylinder elements of the diesels. This is a cylinder sleeve, a liner for those engines, just a valve here. But this will give you an idea about uh, their size. The ones in your car are probably about that big around and about that high. So. A little bit different, and these move up and down about three feet. We're going to pan around just so you get an idea of what's here in the aft motor room. There's a comparable space like this up forward, but this one is open a little more, so it's easier to see some of these key components. Starting up here, this is another lube oil tank, that white structure there, and there's another one in the center and another one over on the far side. This big green monster is not the wall in uh, one of the baseball teams uh, stadium out east I think Boston I'll forgive me if I don't know for sure but in any event this is a motor and there's where the shaft coming out of the motor eventually works its way to the propeller aft or one of the two propellers this would be the port aft motor now this thing is probably about 20 feet high from its base to the top here roughly 12 feet across and about 12 feet deep. So a pretty, pretty hefty piece of hardware. This electric motor is called jacking gear. It turns very, very slowly and only when we're in port and no power is being generated for propulsion. In other words, this motor itself is not turning to move the ship. What this does is turn the rotor about once an hour. 
Not enough to put any real thrust on the propeller, but enough to keep the bearings lubricated so that the shaft doesn't seize or bind up in the bearings. That's its only purpose. Now, coming down here, you see where the shaft comes out of the motor and into another massive structure. This big block is called a Kingsbury thrust bearing. And it's, I refer to it during the tours, this is where push comes to shove. Some point in time, when the propeller is turning back aft, you have to, let's say that the, where the light's coming out here is the propeller end of the shaft. You have to take the thrust coming from the propeller, pushing the shaft this way, and transmit it to the ship. That's what this device does. Picture the shaft with a ring in its center, a big disc right in the middle here, polished on both faces. Inside this thrust bearing are two other rings anchored to the ship. So they're fixed and you have the disc in the center turning on the shaft, pushing against one or the other of those faces. Now the movement is obviously in thousandths of an inch with an oil film in between, but that's what this device does. Another thing of interest these are the same size as the thrust bearings on the original Queen Elizabeth. They had to be for this ship because of the nature of its power in ice. The tremendous thrust needed to break, as I said, we broke through 16 foot thick ice in the Gulf of St. Lawrence. This vessel had to function year in, year out, day in, day out in the wintertime in the ice. So the thrust necessary, the sheer force to push through the ice was taken up by these massive devices, these Kingsbury thrust bearings. I just thought I'd come down here so you get an idea physically of the size of these motors. I'm six foot one, and I am trying to stand up straight. Here you get a, another feel for the size of the motors, the size of this Kingsbury thrust bearing, the dimensions of the shaft, it's about two foot diameter at this point. Uh, the, the steering gear, just the immensity of this equipment that was necessary to make the ship move. The uh, portion of the film where you see a lot of very modern stainless steel skyscrapers, glass and, and shiny metal and so on, that's in Detroit coming through Lake St. Clair and uh, through the Detroit River. There's a structure or two that look like big uh, silos that you'd see on a Midwestern farm, but however, that's the Renaissance Center in uh, downtown Detroit. This ring here on the shaft, this white ring inside that shroud, has teeth on the outside of it. And again, you see a motor and a jacking gear. So that turned this shaft, again, maybe once an hour, just enough to keep the bearings. This is a support bearing right there in that housing, just to keep that from binding. Another thing I had the folks on my watch do, obviously oil through this Kingsbury thrust bearing was very key. Uh, you may not see it too well, but there's a little red rectangular flap right there. They'd open that up and you could watch oil flowing through the pipe. And if they didn't see oil, they were instructed to yell for help at the top of their lungs. But they would, every time they walked by, they would open that lid and be sure oil was in there. There's a small fire extinguisher. Uh, one thing I hadn't pointed out before, I'm looking around as I'm talking and I don't see one readily, but uh, we'll cover it later when we get uh, further aft a little bit. The ship's fire extinguishing method was carbon dioxide. If you had a fire board in this compartment, it would smother it by filling the compartment with CO2. Of course, you'd have to remember to have everybody leave the compartment because otherwise they would suffocate and that's not a desired feature. Over on the bulkhead back aft of me here are wedge or pie-shaped bearing plates. They're about a foot across at the top and maybe six inches at the bottom. They're over there in those racks. Those are what form the solid or stationary bearing surfaces that that disc on the shaft itself would rub up against. And as you can see too, it's, you're starting to notice the sides of the ship are no longer vertical. It's starting to slope inward. The strengthening here in the hull, the, the uh, stable, uh, rigid pieces are closer together for more security and strength. And that's all because of the tremendous strain put on the bow and the stern of this vessel moving backward or forward in ice. Uh, when I'm talking about ice too, I should point out, icebreakers don't break ice by ramming it. 
If you ever look at the bow of this vessel, it has a curve to it and then down. That helps it ride up onto the ice. The weight and thrust of the ship crushes the ice and pushes it to the sides. Not by ramming it, but by literally crushing it and pushing it away. Uh, there are times when it gets stuck. Like anything else, it can get up in there and it didn't quite have enough oomph and it gets stuck. Now you can't just back out. You have to kind of wiggle and loosen it before you back out. There are saddle tanks on each side of this vessel. We walk past them in the engine rooms. They're on the outboard sides of the ship. They are roughly uh, 30 feet high. They're about four feet wide and they run about 80 to 100 feet each. So those are pretty fair size. There are transfer pumps up in the overhead in the engine room and their only purpose is to move water from one of those tanks to the other one very, very quickly on the order of about 7,000 gallons a minute, each gallon weighing a little over eight pounds. So you're talking about thousands and thousands of pounds being shifted from one side of the ship to the other. Uh, and you can go from a 10 degree list to port to 10 degree list to starboard in one and a half minutes. So you get the ship kind of moving this way, then you can back it off the ice. This came into play when the ship first came here, a little bit of history. In 83, we were tied up on the north side of this breakwater that we're presently at, and the breakwater was solid all the way out into the lake to the north-south breakwater. We were actually in the Chicago River, not Monroe Street Harbor. After being there a couple of years, somebody in Chicago's bureaucracy noticed that we were in violation of the terms of our lease agreement, which says Monroe Street Harbor. So we had to move our ship. It cost us about a quarter of a million dollars to move 40 feet from that side of the breakwater to where we are today. We had to sink pilings here in the harbor. We had to cut 80 feet out of the existing pier for the ship to fit in alongside the breakwater. We had to have tugboats to move us. Another uh, one of my buddies and I came down here and we literally pumped over 2,000 tons of water out of the ship to bring us up because the harbor draft at that time was only about 18 feet. In fact, we did brush a couple of the concrete anchors for the pots that are out there in the harbor now. When you look down the line of some of the pots, they're not quite as straight as they used to be. Some of them are off center a little bit. Well, we know how that happened. What happened too that was of interest, the first year that we were on this side of the breakwater, the south side, uh, I brought my family down for the 4th of July fireworks display. Now, the barges for the city of Chicago's fireworks display, actually on the 3rd of July every year, are fired from right here in Monroe Street Harbor. So this is the place to watch the fireworks from. Well, as it starts to get dark, everybody starts migrating to the port side of the ship, to the fireworks side of the ship, and we started to take a list. Now, this was the first year we were on this side of the breakwater, and I got a call from the club uh, manager saying, Jules, all of our toilets are racking up. They had been designed to empty off the other side of the ship and we didn't have a pressure system to get rid of that debris. So he says, what are we gonna do? I said, hope that there's some water in the saddle tanks. I came down to the rail deck. I was up on deck having a barbecue and a beer and so on. And uh, I ran down to the rail deck, got the emergency diesel started, ran down to the engine room here, threw the right circuit breakers and so on that you saw before and got one of the transfer pumps to run. I had to hold the relays closed with a two by four because they were all rusted and sparking and so on. And I'm up 20 feet above us, uh, up, in the, up in the loft where the, where the pump itself is, holding the breaker shut, counting one, 1,000, two, 1,000, three, 1,000, four, 1,000 and so on. I held it shut for about a minute and a half, let go, ran back down and checked the inclinometer in the control room. We now had a slight list about a degree and a half back to starboard and you could hear all the sewage running off the ship, went back, watched the fireworks, and then after the event, we put in a pressurized system so we don't have to do that anymore. But those are some of the fun things that make this such a unique and near and dear club to be a part of. Some of the final footage uh, shows Lake Michigan starting to kick up and you can start to see white caps and pretty heavy swells. That storm on Lake Michigan made us believers in how well the ship was designed. At one point, we were literally taking solid water against the windows in the wheelhouse, three to four stories above water level. 
near the end of this footage, the camera has moved inside as opposed to being outdoors because water is in fact hitting those windows on the bridge. It was not only cold, it was dangerous out on deck. Some of you may wonder why there's that interior wall of steel and windows. It's there for a reason that if water strong enough hits those outside windows, that interior bulkhead is there to protect the helmsman. After we made the turn into Lake Michigan with a very strong wind from the north and we had a following sea, we couldn't help but remember the sister ship to this vessel of same design had sunk in those same conditions. If you go and look at the very end of the rail deck where railroad cars came onto the vessel, the only protection back there was a very thin metal door, much like the doors you see pulled down in front of shops at night. Very thin, no real strength to it at all. A wave had broken that door in on the sister ship, and it, uh, so much water came in, it lost buoyancy and went down like a brick. The waves in Lake Michigan were incredible. The plan had been to stop in Kenosha to pick up those club members who had contributed to the bond fund but were not able to make the trip so that they could ride the final 40-50 miles. The swells in the harbor at Kenosha were in excess of 12 feet, so we opted not to even bother trying. It came right from Kenosha down to Chicago. That uh, the night we arrived, we uh, moored at Navy Pier. On the way back to the aft steering room, or steering gear room, this is a machine shop area. This is typical of all ships too. When something breaks, if you don't have the spare part, you can't run down to Ace Hardware for it. So you make it. We would carry a lot of bar stock and sheet metal and things of that nature. There would typically be a milling machine, a metal lathe, a drill press, all kinds of equipment of that nature. Our sole piece of equipment was this uh, wire brush and grinder, and it didn't work. So we didn't have a whole lot of capability to fabricate something if it broke. But the main idea was to get the ship here and uh, not worry about other things. Now on both sides back here is one thing that is kind of unique. Uh, back behind you that I'm looking at now, as you pan around, you will see a capstan. This is to help the ship when it moors. These are very typical of the, the uh, winches that you have on your sailboats. The electric powered, in this instance of course, and using and big hawsers, these run up to the weather decks where the uh, heads are and then you can help moor the ship by uh, engaging these motors and turning these caps down. Oh, I was talking about the fire system. This is just, uh, there are five or six cylinders of CO2 here. There's another area on the vessel up near the stack and there's 57 more of these and all of the red piping is not fire water, that's CO2 system piping and you'll see levers like this to discharge CO2 into any given space. There are controls up on the bridge to electronically activate devices to flood individual sections of the ship with carbon dioxide and so on. But there are little horn shaped uh, openings where the CO2 would come out. This is one right here in the CO2 gas line. There's another one over to the right of it. And there's space so that they would literally flood this compartment with CO2 had there been a fire. And you might wonder, looking around, all you see is metal. What could burn? Well, there's a lot of paint that could burn, a lot of the packing for some of the spare parts that are in these wood and cardboard crates, all of that would burn. Um, the oils, of course, that are on the ship would catch fire. This is a fire main, this is a water main. This looks a little more familiar to you. Where those, new, those pumps that we saw earlier in the tour could take water from overboard and send it through fire lines like this and you'd hook up a fire hose and be able to put a fire out that way. Okay, we're nearing the end of the ship and the end of the tour. As I said before, this is kind of like the power steering in your car. When you turn the wheel, it's very effortlessly moving the wheels of your car and changing your uh, direction of travel. Now on the ship, when you turn the wheel up on the bridge, it sends an impulse or signal down here to these two motors. This large one here and one just like it on the other cylinder back on the other side here. And there, is a, there are two pistons that move parallel and in reverse order. 
it would be like my hands moving this way and that way. There's a linkage bar between them that turns and the rudder shaft is connected to that. And that's what turns the rudder here. It can go to full left to full right in 24 seconds from full one way, full the other. So again, that was part of the design of this vessel. It had to be infinitely maneuverable and infinite control of propeller rotation and, and speed and also of the rudder position itself so that you could move the ship, turn it in its own length and get into the very, very close harbors that it had to operate in. So this is what the steering gear looks like and the actual rudder shaft is this massive structure back here that you can possibly see in my flashlight. There's a big arm that says you can move that manually in an emergency. You disconnect the linkage to these motors and then put pins in here and turn this by hand with cables and pulleys that are behind me on the bulkheads. I would not want to try and have to move this by hand ever. But that's the rudder shaft back here and the control arm to give you some leverage to try and move it manually in an absolute emergency. We are now in the uh, aft gland room and literally at the stern of the ship, you can hear it echoing in my voice because we're in a very small area. If you'll notice, the structure of the hull here is changing to a curvature and how much closer together the ribs are getting. That's to strengthen the hull because of the tremendous impact, especially backing up in an ice field of 16 to 20 feet thick. You can imagine what that's like. So, and this is all designed to deflect ice away from the props and so on. But this is the shaft, rusted now, but at one time it was all very nice polished stick steel, and through a support bearing, that green housing here, and then through a shaft gland, that's where this room gets its name, gland room. What's happening, if you can picture, let's say the batteries in my flashlight are the shaft, and the body of the flashlight is the outside of the gland. It's lined with strips. If you remember seeing old lath and plaster construction, those narrow slats of a wood called lignum vitae. It comes from South America. It has a unique property. When it's wet, it feels soapy or slippery or oily. These long slats are all the way around the shaft, and there's a purposeful leakage of water from outside, just a slight leakage to keep that surface inside the gland wet. That's why you see these uh, studs here with gears on them, and you could move this ring, <clears throat> excuse me, in and out to loosen the packing in the gland just enough to get a drip of water, constant drip of water at the bottom, and that water would fall into the bilge and be pumped back overboard, but that would keep the shaft gland lubricated. Now, since we're sitting and not running anymore, we've tightened these glands so there is no more leakage. That's why they become rusted and so on. But that's where the shaft goes out through the skin of the ship and how you lubricate that gland so it turns freely. People would say, my gosh, it's leaking. Well, yeah, it's supposed to. By the way, the diameter of the prop is about 13 feet, tip to tip. And they are incredibly strong blades to be able to chop up the ice and handle it as they were backing into it or pushing or pulling forward through it. I thought I might give you a little perspective here on these automatic watertight doors. They separate the gland room from the motor room. There's another set that separates the motor room from the engine room, the aft engine room, another set aft to forward engine room, and so on. So the ship is divided up into six segmented compartments, and they're automatically controlled from up on the bridge or in the control room where we first started our tour.
Some of the final scenes of the movie footage shot during the voyage are of particular significance to me personally as well as to the club. You see Abby arriving in Chicago at the end of her final voyage. I didn't really realize it at the time, although I thought it might be this was my final voyage too. Unless, of course, you all decide that you need a bigger ship someday and I'm still around and capable of getting up a gangplank, I'd buy a ticket to ride. 